we are going to start with a plenary discussion the theme three and theme four was dealing with creating enabling learning environment for preparing 21st century teachers and theme four was dealing what is quality teacher education of the 21st century and this is logically following up to what we have been dealing with yesterday which was about knowledge skills values and competency of 21st century teachers today we are dealing with what is it that we should create what environment should exist for us to have those skills in our teacher programs that we want Therefore, I'm opening up for discussion. The discussion should be not about a lot of contributions because we are going to discuss in the breakaway groups. It should be about questions of clarity. Even if it is contribution, it should be very brief. I think we are able to speak in one or two minutes. Please be very brief and considerate so that we don't get into the time of the next presentations. I think we have two roaming mics. I will take two questions at a stage or two comments, not two, four questions or comments at a, at a, at a time. And thereafter, allow the keynote speakers or respondents to respond. If you are asking a question, be concise and indicate to whom are you directing your question. We'll start now with this side. Are there two people who are ready to ask any question? There's one at the back there, the second one here. This side, are there two people? There's one there, and I will take the other person there. Can we start with these people? Those that are having the mics, please at the back there. And the people that are assisting, you must move very fast so that we don't have time to waste. No, 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 the, the person there. Then after me, it's here. It's here. Oh. And remember, I am allocating a maximum of two minutes. If you can speak in one minute, I will highly appreciate that. And I'm very fast. Uh, thank you very much for the floor given. Mine is to how do we align you see, in schools, I'm taught by, I can say approximately 20 teachers, but now I'm coming to a learning institutions of higher learning where I wa they want to train me to become a teacher. I'm going only to be molded by only one particular person in that particular subject. How do I align two? Because we teach the way how we've been taught in schools. The other one is where there's no content. This one is the second speaker. Where there's no content, what have you to do with that? Thank you. Thank you. Can you give over to the other who have requested the floor? Good morning. My question is directed to the speaker from the fin Finland. Uh, would you please share with us, from the Finnish perspective, what research tools or instruments or frameworks do teacher educators use to ascertain the impact or the effectiveness of the pedagogical processes on the learning outcomes. Research tools, instruments, thank you. There was a hand that side. Can we get the mic to him? To him first. Good morning. Uh, my question is directed to Patrick. Uh, and it is uh, from the perspective of us being a model school, partnering with uh, UNAM. After I have looked at uh, the, the picture that you have shown here, is there a way, maybe during this time, that we can pave a way of uh, having such a, a framework on which we can work Practically. Thank you. The next speaker is that side. 
Thank you. Uh, my question also goes to uh, Professor Sari. Uh, could you please uh, shed some light on the practical component of your teacher training in terms of uh, assessment and placement? Thank you. Thank you very much. I will now ask the keynote speakers to whom questions were directed to respond. Can we have the mic here for them to respond? The next round of questions, I will highly appreciate it if you can briefly indicate your name and maybe the institution. Shall I start? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the, the questions. Um, first question for me was uh, related to the content. So as I mentioned that we are not so much focusing on the content knowledge and that's probably an arising a little bit uh, concern that what, what does it really mean. Uh, especially in the subject teacher education, if students want to become uh, mathematics teachers or biology teachers, they study their content in their own discipline. So they first go to study biology uh, or mathematics in the university level. And later on in the third uh, study year, they come to the, uh, our school to teach education to do their pedagogical studies. And they, during their pedagogical studies, we don't focus on the content knowledge. So we uh, apply their content understanding to the practical situation, how to apply their own content to the when, uh, teaching context when, when I'm teaching first graders or fifth graders or high school students. It's a different approaches or pedagogical decisions what teachers have to do in different groups. So that's what happened with the subject teachers. We have a lot of contents for them. But in, in primary school, teacher education, so the class teachers who are teaching all subject, uh, all subject uh, in their own class, we estimate that their understanding of the uh, school subjects are in a level that they can uh, cope in the primary level. So they have just studied the contents in high school and it's much further than what we teach in the primary level. So with the uh, class teachers, we just um, repeat a little bit, we remind them about the contents, but the focus is mainly in, in pedagogy. Of course, we have some students who need a little bit more repetition in the content knowledge as well, but there are lots of uh, books available for that. Sometimes we recommend them to take, a bo take this book and remind yourself about what is physics, about the light, or what is, an, uh, uh, what is an electricity, or whatever. So it's taken account, but the emphasis in teacher education is in pedagogical skills. The second question related to the uh, research tools and instruments uh, for the outcomes of teacher education. Did I understood, uh, understand correctly? Yes. So, to measure uh, teacher education, uh, as I told that uh, uh, all of our teacher educators are involved in the research work. So, at the same time, when we are implementing our teacher education courses, we are collecting an research data. We are having a lot of surveys for the students. We are collecting um, video, video material, what they are doing during their practice or their internship periods. We analyze that data and we write um, uh, research articles. We, as I said, we collaborate with the other universities. We're doing lots of benchmarking, also finding uh, uh, best practices and with uh, using them on our, our uh, teacher education. And 
using the general research methods, surveys, interviews, videos, to collect data from the different context to be able to, to uh, describe or even generalize the outcomes of teacher education. Every five years, we have also the external quality assurance procedure. So, uh, in Finland, we have an, uh, a national uh, evaluation, if I translate it, it's a uh, quality assurance evaluation center, which comes every five years to make an external evaluation about our programs. So, this is the one method how we can compare with the other programs and to see in which level we are. But more often we are required to do self-evaluation through the research or through the student feedback. After every course we have to ask feedback from the students about the learning environment, about the content of the course and about the management of the course. So, there is a immediate feedback from the students uh, to regulate the outcomes of the teacher education. And uh, the fourth question related to uh, the practical component. Uh, what is the, give an example of practical component of this uh, teacher competence map, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah and in terms of the the assessment and placement. Practical component means uh, in our uh, map that uh, there is an interrelationship between the theory and practice. So that's basically uh, that all the theoretical courses what we uh, provide for the students are reflected also in terms of the internship. Students go to the school, as um, Prof. Matengu said, that we have these university practice schools where the students uh, uh, implement their teaching practice every year, six weeks. And they are supervised by the university practice teachers. They are uh, class teachers, teachers, and uh, as we heard, most of them have also PhD. So they are supervising the students in the school and know what we, they have studied in theoretically already. Though they try to link the theoretical understanding to the practice. And I have given the assignments for them, what they have to do during their teaching practice, only focusing the issues, what they are in theoretical level, but they have to be able already in teacher education to implement those concepts in their own teaching. And assessment is part, part of, of that, So uh, as because we are really much focusing on formative assessment in the basic education, and more and more in teacher education. It means that those teacher students are all the time doing their assignments and those are part of their e-portfolio. So they can see how they develop as a teachers. In the end of their uh, education, they can ba go back and look at, oh, that was me thinking like that in the beginning. And that's the way how we develop their metacognition, their ability to reflect their own thoughts and to recognize that we are really learning. And it motivates them. When you recognize that you have succeeded in your thinking, it keeps on going further again. So that's basically, basically the practical component. So practice, uh, this is an, it's a part of this alignment, what Patrick talked, that we really need to be aware what happens in the school, what is the theoretical understanding of those things, and those parts of uh, teacher education, they really must to discuss with each other. Okay, thank you. The next speaker. So I think uh, 
there is part of the answer to both of these questions is about relationships and building relationships and taking the time to do that work so that we are working and iterating with one another over time. So the first question about alignment with multiple schools, it is not possible to align to every single school in every single context. But when you have your teacher educators aligning with some schools in different contexts, they get the sense of what that is. And then in the program that I discussed at length, that we are preparing these teachers to go into this school district or this cluster with this kind of curriculum and these communities. And so it's much easier to do that alignment there for those teachers. In my other programs where I'm sending them to multiple school districts, what I have to teach them to do is to consume the curriculum that is there in those schools and adapt it with what they know about best practice relative to learning. But they also have to know how to keep their jobs if the principal wants them to do X, right? Not to close their door and say, okay, I'm gonna hide in here because those students are going on to the next class and that has implications, but how to start to show that these changes uh, make a difference for kids learning. And we can only know that when our teacher educators are in relationship with our different schools and we are teaching them how to be consumers and enactors of different kinds of curriculum. So that is, that is one. And then I think th there will be a dovetail here. Uh, thinking about the model schools, if I understand correctly, you shake your head yes or no if I'm right or wrong here, that the idea of the model schools is to start to build those relationships and those partnerships between some schools in the university and then grow them and then add more, and then those model schools become sites for deliberation and for understanding what's working, what's not working, research sites in, in, in some ways, and then that grows and will grow into the other context, into the, the multiple contexts. But how do you start is the question. Yes, and I think that you, the principals in the model schools will have a session tomorrow that will actually give you some tools about how to start that and that the university people, it's not just about what you're doing, it's about what you are doing with them. And how, what, are, what is your problem that you need to solve? My second graders can't do these kinds of things. It's based on some kind of data. We lose these many students at seventh grade. I don't know what that is for you, we saw the data yesterday, yes? Um, what is the data that you're basing your problem on and who at the university can help you work together? What resources do you need? Not just money, money is essential, but it is not everything. Who are the thinkers that can help you solve your problem and then the university gets better? at doing that work themselves. And I think my, my colleague next to me highlighted an idea about doing research. The example that I showed you of that particular teacher educator, all of her research is about teacher education in mathematics at the elementary level. Not all of my professors that, that I work with do that kind of work, but there are models of that and the university supports her doing that and because that is her research line, right? And so there's a, symbi there's, there's a connection there. So how can you build those up is a question for you. Okay, thank you very much. I think the, the others who are not getting the questions, I will ask them also to respond later on. I'm going to take my next round of questions. I will, I will give them a chance. I will not allow them not to say something. I already have a hand there. Is there another hand this side before I move that side? There's a second hand. There's one hand there. Then there's one hand at the back. Can I start there? Uh, thank you. Uh, mine is actually a point of uh, clarification uh, to Prof. Uh, Mas. Uh, you, you mentioned that uh, we need to admit uh, right student, could you elaborate on that? What will that entail? Thank you. Second, can I add the other person this side before I move the other side? 
All right, thank you very much. I am Abba James from Unam Katima Campus. Now, my concern, I think it goes to Prof. Patrick. Uh, if I get you right, you were of the view that we need to mirror our practice to reflect those of the schools. And my worry there, although from the perspective of the public domain, you may not agree that most of the opinions we are getting at that level might be purely based on public sympathy without hard evidence. In other ways, what the, the public or the parents at that level might be coming out with their own respective views might be based more on the public outcries. And if we are not careful in just buying into that, I don't know how that will affect the quality of our output. So I'm asking this question perhaps for your further guidance in view of our proposed uh, curriculum review so that you may guide us further how we should approach that. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is this side. Thank <laughs> you. I'm Maggie Biakas Amos from the Center for Open Distance and E-Learning at UNAM. And my question is to Prof. Sexton about the deep content knowledge. I, I'm interested in, in, in knowing how do you achieve that, knowing that knowledge is everywhere these days. We don't have to focus that much on content anymore, but how do you achieve deep content knowledge? What strategies do you use along the lines of flip classroom or whatever? I'm, I'm just curious to know. Thank you. The next, at the back there, If it do me switched off, <laughs> I did not get this skill during teacher training. <laughs> um, uh, doctor, my question is to the respondent, um, Professor Maas. You know, um, we have heard from Prof. Havu Nutinen that they've got a national regulatory body for education. Now, my question is with regard to um, how do we differentiate between a competent teacher versus that one is, that is certified? Because he talked about a functionally qualified teacher in the absence of teacher licensing. Because we don't have that in, 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 in our country. Um, I know that we have a probationary period of 12 months during which we are supposed to induct and mentor a teacher. And thereafter, we also conduct class visits and A, B, C, D. But I, don't, I haven't seen a situation whereby we, uh, you know, punish the teacher for being certified but not being competent. Maybe negligence is something else. If my question is not so well, we are living in a complex uh, environment already. <laughs> so it's part of the confusion. Can somebody please rescue me from this microphone? <laughs> Thank you very much. I will ask Professor Mas to respond to those questions that were directed to her. If it is complex, we'll bring it back to you to resolve the complex issue. Thank you very much. Um, let me start first with a question about um, admission of the right student. How do we know who that is and how do we set admission criteria? I think if, if there's something that we've heard this morning that we need to take home is that whatever decisions we are taken must be informed by research. Um, so it's not about just coming together and think, uh, do we think 30 points is okay or 31 points or this or that. It's about doing some research about it. It's about profiling our current students to get a sense of um, who are the good performers because we are doing these assessments in teaching practice. We can pick up these students that are doing the things that we want them to do. Um, so let's profile them. Let's see if there is a common denominator. Let's see if there's something that we can get from that. Um, but 
Also, another thing that will inform our admission criteria is first of all an understanding by ourselves on what do we want this teacher to be? What do we want the product to be? We always have to start at the product before we can start molding that product. So, so we will have to ask that question. I think there was a lot of discussions here this week about what is the qualities of a 21st century teacher? Um, and if we answer that question for Namibia to say that this is the teacher we want, then we need to say, okay, what is, what is the potential that we start with? What are the qualities of the potential that we start with? Because obviously we have a role to play in developing that teacher. Um, so for me, it's a process that cannot be done one afternoon over tea or coffee, but it's something that needs to be informed by research, it needs to be informed by information, profiling our students and deciding what we want to be. The question of what we are doing in the meantime, while we don't have a, a, a regulatory body, why we don't have teacher certification, um, how do we differentiate the competent teacher from the certified teacher? Um, I think this is where we really need to, to put our heads together and come up with a process for that. I'm not sure what the current probation process is or the end of probation process is for the teachers. Maybe that is something that needs to be looked at. And, and, and you hinted on, um, you know, without punishing the competent teacher or co punishing the teacher that is certified, that has a certification but is not necessarily competent. Um, I do believe that whatever we um, develop, whatever we put in place, must be supportive. It must be there to develop the person. It must be a second chance and a third chance that we give to people, because I think we all, we all deserve those things in life. Thank you. I think the other two questions were for me. Um, I'm gonna take the deep content knowledge question first. I think there are a couple of things. Uh, one contextual piece. I was very clear um, when, I was, when I chose to talk about core practices that I wanted to stress that, there was, that they were reliant on deep content knowledge in part because someone in my country might see this sometime. <laughs> and there is a deep controversy around these core practices because there is a set of researchers that have in their mind that this is a checklist and that you check it off and you do this practice and you get this result in any context, absent of content. And that could not be further from the truth if you really read deeply the researcher's work that again I can share with you. Um, and one of those researchers is the professor that I showed there, Elham, Dr. Elham Kazemi. Um, so that is one of the reasons that I stressed that uh, so much. I'll say a couple of other things about content knowledge. Um, we are a graduate program. And so all of my secondary teachers, for example, have to finish degrees essentially in biology if they want to be a biology teacher. I do not have the time in one year to teach them the biology. I can talk about the pedagogical content knowledge. It's not just biology, but it's about how children think about biology that you really need to understand. You need to take all of your knowledge and actually then think about how, do the, how will the children learn this. And so that's sort of the deep part. It is not just deep um, in the content itself. It's, it's broader than that about how children think about the content. And then, um, and, and we, this shows up in our elementary program. Every, all of our elementary teachers have finished undergraduate degrees. They come to us, they've had some mathematics, but we have them take a 100 level, which is the lowest level mathematics class that is directed at math. They have to take this before they come to us, after they're admitted sometimes or before they apply. That is about um, the pedagogical content knowledge of the content that they understand. It's not about teaching them how to teach. It's about children's thinking in that content because so many elementary teachers are, in my context, they come to us a little bit afraid of mathematics in particular, and so we, we, we hit them deeply with you can do this, you can build on this, and you have to actually take it from the children's point of view about what the deep learning there. Okay, and if I understand the other question, I'm going to do my best, sir, to try, um, I think I heard two things. What about the community response? 
and something about replicating practice that, that we see there. So I want to be really clear. I am not talking about going into schools and seeing partners, schools, and replicating practices that we don't want our teachers to do. That is not at all what I'm talking about. It's very important that you understand that, that we have to actually come to common visions about what good practice is, but we also have to understand where are we and what's going to be expected of the teachers. And so I, I want to be clear, I'm not talking about replicating bad practice. Um, and, and the second thing, the community response. I, as I was going through my whole presentation at every slide, I thought this professor or this colleague would say, why aren't you talking about this? And why aren't you talking about that? And why aren't you talking about this relative to the issue that I was, I was talking about? And one of them was about our community partners. Our community members are at the table as, and this is one of our biggest struggles, is to actually have the parents, have the community organizations at the table to help us understand what does success mean for them? And what would our teachers be doing so that those teachers, so that those children can be successful. But we also have to understand that in some cases, they are just products of the schools that have been reproducing the kinds of things that we don't want to see anymore. So it actually takes, again, relationship building with them to help them understand what is education for, right? What is it for? Where are we going? So um, I, I, I will rest there. OK, thank you very much. I will take the last round of questions and comments. I will start this side. There's one hand up there. Anyone else? There's only one hand that side. Two. This side. One, two. At the back there. I'm Elago from UNAM. Uh, this is directed to Professor Sexton. And uh, I would like to understand your model more through two pictures that you shared with us. Um, the first one involves uh, student teachers watching a modeling, a lesson modeling session, and another one, a, re uh, a rehearsal one. Uh, my question is, I would like to know what is the mix of that group of learners, or, or student teachers, I mean? Uh, do they, are they expected to be teaching the same subject? Or is it a mix of, of, of student teachers that uh, to teach, one would teach physics, another, uh, another subject? Or is, is, this, is this to do with the level of, uh, of, 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 of school that they are supposed to be teaching at, whether it is primary school, uh, primary school or secondary school? So thank you. OK, the other person. Thank you very much. I'm Silas Walders from UNAM. My question is to the two keynote speakers. How do you establish your research agenda in your different universities for education? Thank you. This side. I'm Caroline Anyanueva from UNESCO Regional Office for Southern Africa. I think from the two keynotes, the key concept is alignment. And it means alignment for the curriculum with the teachers, alignment for in so many ways, alignment with the vision. And my question is related to the last uh, uh, person who asked a question. And it's clear that we need research to back this alignment. But yesterday we heard from UNICEF that in fact, Namibia is gold data, but the problem is data phobic. So our challenge is to craft a research agenda to help this alignment. So my question is actually to the vice chancellor. As the vice chancellor and of uh, the university which uh, shapes teacher educators, what kind of research agenda do you have to craft and how will you drive this research agenda? Thank you. Last one. Hi, I'm Pamela Feburi. Um, I wanted um, 
to speak about the autonomy, sorry, autonomy versus, not versus, maybe just, uh, in, okay. So, so um, Finnish teachers have autonomy in their, in their classes to teach what they want. And, and, and as a Finnish product, I, I realize that that is one of the, the, the secrets uh, or one of the, the key points in making your education uh, uh, so strong. Because teachers feel, I can do in my class what I, what I would like to do and what is best for my learners and what helps them teach. Whereas we follow very strict curriculum to the point of a syllabus. And, and, and now, uh, and this is just in the absence of having teacher standards. Yeah. yeah? So now you're having the teacher standards. My question is, um, is there maybe a little bit of fear that that could have an impact on that autonomy? Thank you very much. There was someone who was pleading with me. Normally I'm not considerate, but I will be considerate today. The last speaker, please be very brief. And I will also plea with the respondents to try to be concise. And I will allow everyone also to make their concluding remarks, those that have been asked question two, and the rest who have not received questions, I will ask you also to make your concluding remarks. All right. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Mr. Riwakov from Concordia College, one of the model schools as well. Uh, my question is directed to Professor Patrick regarding the alignment of the school-based project uh, practice. Um, how does the system in the U.S. Um, intervene within the different phases during the duration of these studies uh, that, that these student teachers are doing their studies to pick up discrepancies and how do they remedy those solutions? Um, and how do they align that, especially in terms of logistics, considering that Namibia is, uh, the schools are not well distributed. Although we have a small population, our towns are from one another and the economic, socioeconomic situation varies from region to region. How do you tackle that so that we then model after that? Okay, thank you very much. Can I have the mic? We'll start with Professor Matengu to answer his question and also at the same time make your concluding remarks. Uh, I, I, you caught me by surprise. I thought I would be the last. <laughs> so I have time to think. But uh, um, I think as far as I'm concerned, they, uh, no university I know that has a problem with setting a research agenda. All universities have research agendas. The problem is how to structure the operations of that agenda and how to resource it. So as a university, we have had th these different sorts of uh, research agendas and research strategy. And we have even encouraged faculties to have their own research strategy. The problem is how do we structure it so that it is functional and effective. Um, my own thoughts around this is that the best way uh, to structure it is to have um, predetermined uh, broad research areas or thematic areas from which uh, research is undertaken so that it is focused and it is not anybody doing research as they like. Uh, and to link that to postgraduate uh, education and ensure that the postgraduate uh, students, whether they're at master's or PhD, at least most of them would be on full-time basis. Because if we don't do that, we have people, uh, some sort of a misalignment where a student comes and says, I want to do a research on why my grandfather's urine doesn't go far. And he's putting that research to a music student, I mean a music lecturer. What you then have is a situation where people are not able to supervise because it, their research topics are not linked to their capabilities and competencies. This, this is a problem, it's there uh, and I'm aware of it. So, and that is why I think it is important that we predetermine uh, and the, the faculties would define maybe 10 or 15 areas through which uh, people would choose research topics and then that would be based on the competencies to, to supervise. 
in general, I think that's what I could say. <laughs> and how we would drive it is to incentivize uh, research. But the danger, which is, I think, is my uh, final remarks, massification is the danger we have. <laughs> and that is true whether it is in school setup or in the university, where you have a lot of students and no lecturer has time to actually work with them in terms of uh, researching and coaching. Uh, and I think this is also a problem in, in, in primary and secondary schools where the, the ratio of teacher learner is so high that there is no time uh, for research. What we would ideally desire is that even the teachers that are in primary and secondary schools, they should be doing research in themselves and see how they improve their own situation and contributing or writing uh, textbooks based on their experiences and best practice. But this is not happening because of the, the danger of massification and I think this is something we need to address. Thank you very much, Professor Mas. Thank you very much. I think for me the take home message from this session is define what you need, um, align your selection processes accordingly, um, align your program accordingly, um, informed by partnerships, by collaboration, effective feedback loops and research, research, research. Thank you. Next. Uh, I'll address the first question about the mix of student teachers. That is, that program is all elementary. So in that program in that year, there are 60 elementary teachers and we break them up into two different groups and so there were 30 in that particular class. There was another 30 doing it with another set of teachers and teacher educators. So there's all elementary teachers, all subjects. Um, Discrepancies in funding, that is a question that we should have dinner over. Um, it is a big question, so, and it is not my, it's not my area of focus. We have mechanisms to identify which schools are, have got the most high poverty children, are in high poverty communities, have more English language learners in them, have more students with special needs, and the funding patterns follow those schools. But more to my work, how do we we partner with those schools when we can to address their problems of practice. We work with them in a variety of different ways on research grants and other professional development grants to support them in their needs when they identify them to us. We don't identify the problem, we identify it with them. Um, then it becomes, if not, it's research on instead of research with, and it doesn't have any impact if it's I'm doing research on you. Um, and then uh, research agenda. This is my problem of practice because all I don't supervise anyone. I'm not actually in charge of anyone, but I'm responsible for all of it. It's an interesting problem that I have. And so creating a research agenda is about how do I bring the people like Professor Kazumi together with the other people in my world to actually talk about what it is that they're doing and how can we align, oh, you, you're doing that, you can do, oh, do, do these things align? Are these things working together? Could we do this? Would you learn something if you were working with her? And so it's a lot from my perspective about relationships. I also have the benefit of lots of doctoral students who want to be teacher educators. So I work really intensively with them and with some of the faculty on helping them craft research agendas that feed my programs. So they learn how to do research by feeding back and doing research on and with my programs. And so that's one way that I'm able to craft that agenda that's specific to my personal needs for my programs. Thank you. So the research agenda in Finland, um, we start from the university level. So university will uh, implement a vision and strategies uh, for their work and especially for education and for the research. They separate these and there is a university level framework. What kind of research is expected to be completed in the university level? The faculties are following the university strategies. Faculties are required to find the appropriate uh, statements from the university level and put them to more concrete level in the faculty level. And in faculty, 
uh, all schools are doing their own agenda for the research work. And that goes very much as Patrick explained, that um, people come together and they think about what are the current issues, what we need to know more. And they put their competence and their skills and their previous experiences together. This is very much uh, charge for the re professors. They have to establish uh, research groups where the other lecturers, PhD students, even the master degree students are working together and looking the phenomenon from the different viewpoints. And all the professors, they have their own specific fields. Like I have the pre-primary level, so I'm very much looking the teaching and learning in pre-primary level and the issues what we are uh, challenging and what are my concerns in terms of that in basic education or in, in teacher education. So there are like an, uh, different levels of establishing, but the professors in the schools are required to implement all this research work. The second question for me, uh, for me uh, Dr. February, talk about uh, autonomy and, and this is um, the issue which comes from the, our history. I think teachers uh, have a huge autonomy in their teaching. They have an, an, there are two words what, what we often use when we describe the Finnish education. Teachers have a high responsibility, but high uh, trust as well. So they can really implement the teaching in the classroom in a ways what they really want, but it has to be align with the core curriculum. So there are the different opportunities for teachers to use their strengths and their ab abilities to implement teaching and use the ways what fits their own pedagogical thinking. But they have to respond for the national curriculum. There is no inspecting. Ins uh, inspecting. Nobody is coming to observe to the classroom how you are doing. It's an more a social control. Other colleagues are, of course, telling to the principal if you are not doing your work well. If not colleagues, at least the parents. So especially in the primary level, parents are very eagerly involved what the children are doing in the school. And that's the, the social system in the country is inspecting teachers. And there is not actually a problems uh, in, in this phase. So they still have an, an high autonomy and it's uh, behind of our uh, competence map. So that's why we need these skills that they can implement teaching in different circumstances on their own because they, ha they have a high responsibility. If they are not self-regulated and if they are educated to read only the textbooks, how they can adapt they're uh, working to the different kind of circumstances. It's totally same that in capital Helsinki, it's a different schools than in up north in Lapland. It's same, Windhoek or Katima Mulilo. It's totally the same, same issue that the teachers have to adapt to the different circumstances and they have to regulate their own uh, pedagogical uh, ways of uh, implementing good quality teaching. And those skills, what are in our competence map, are needed that they are able to be autonomy, autonomic in their teaching. And I think it's v uh, this um, competence uh, map uh, is actually uh, supporting and increasing their autonomy and quality in terms of that. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have come to the end of this session. My takeaway message is that there's a context to what we are doing, and that context is important. We're talking about creating an enabling learning environment. What we have had is you create that environment in terms of the vision where you want your country to be. And most of the speakers here, even if we are saying they are up there, they are not satisfied with what where they are. There's always a reflection. There's always room for improvement. There's always continuous learning. 
But I think it is very clear from this discussion that evidence-based policy making in terms of data is so crucial. And we have answered the question, what is quality teacher education? According to Professor Matengu, it is a responsive education system to the needs of society, to the needs of the learners. Therefore, I'm satisfied that we've covered what we want to do. Can we give them a round of applause, please? <laughs> and we are running behind our time. I will ask now my panelists to leave and ask the others who are coming up questions. I'd like to invite the next colleagues who are coming up.